Virtual Legality is a YouTube video series with audio podcast versions presented as commentary and for education and entertainment purposes only. It does not constitute legal advice and does not create an attorney-client relationship. If you have legal questions about the topics discussed, please consult your own legal counsel. Honestly, you don't want to be taking generic legal advice from a YouTube channel or podcast in any event. On with the show. Hello and welcome to another Virtual Legality. I'm your host, Richard Hogue, managing partner of the Hogue Law Business Law Firm of Northville, Michigan, and today we've got what I'm just sure is going to be a shorter episode of Virtual Legality, as we're only going to talk about one thing, the announcement of a new video game, Uh, and that video game is Gearbox Software's Borderlands 3. And the reason I want to talk to you about it on this episode of Virtual Legality uh, is because of the unusual way in which it was announced. Borderlands 3 was not announced at E3 or the Tokyo Game Show or GDC uh, or even in a direct. It was instead announced at PAX East, uh, PAX being the Penny Arcade Expo, of which the Penny Arcade website and group hosts a number of them uh, across the country. And the way it was announced uh, was a bit of a a train wreck, uh, to not to put uh, too fine a point on it. Uh, But it was a train wreck in a way that I thought was actually uh, pretty endearing uh, and uh, useful to take a look at from an industry perspective and the way that the industry has been moving in the past couple years. So first, let's take a look at the game. And if you're not familiar with Borderlands, uh, the Borderlands series, uh, Borderlands is in some ways the progenitor of what we would consider the shared world looter shooter Uh, of today. I've been playing uh, The Division 2 very recently. If you're familiar with this channel, you saw I did an impressions video on that game. I've been enjoying it quite a lot. Uh, And while the original Borderlands uh, wasn't that kind of game, it wasn't a fully shared world shooter, it didn't have uh, a lot of the components that we expect that really have been uh, evolved from uh, Destiny and Bungie and Activision's efforts with that game, it did kind of start things out with the loot progression with the uh, Diablo-esque or Dungeons and Dragons-esque uh, affixes and prefixes being put on the abilities and skills that attach to your weapon. Uh, and Borderlands was kind of a standout in that area, and Borderlands 2 even more so as it kind of expanded what it was that a, a Borderlands game could be. And people have been waiting for Borderlands 3 for a long time. I'm looking right now at the article from Kotaku from yesterday that says Gearbox announces Borderlands 3. The long-anticipated third Borderlands game is coming, Gearbox said today, following months' worth of hints and teases. No word on platforms or a release date just yet. That that jumps out at me. I was actually surprised that they didn't even have maybe a year to show at the end of this trailer. Uh, Often when games are teased and hinted at for a long period of time, uh, the marketing guy in me uh, wants to believe that they are holding on to a release announcement until they're really sure it's going to release in a given window. Uh, We saw this uh, in some respects with Fallout 4 uh, and with some other approaches to game launches, Evil Within 2, uh, so primarily from Bethesda, that really focused on not saying anything about the game itself until it was really close to release. So there was some thought in my head that this would be the same with Borderlands, uh, and it doesn't appear to be the case insofar as they didn't have any release information to reveal yesterday. Uh, The article goes on to say, Uh, This is the fourth entry in the critically and commercially successful loot-shooting Borderlands series after the first two games and Borderlands the pre-sequel, which came out in 2014. It looks a whole lot like the other games. And that's one thing I want to talk about. It does, in fact, look a whole lot like the other games. And that's a really interesting thing to happen with this announcement. Let's take a look at the video itself, which I've queued up here, uh, just so we can have it... uh, in the background and we can take a look at what I'm talking about. This is the official reveal trailer from yesterday. And one of the things that I had really thought that Borderlands 3 would wind up becoming is the open world, shared world looter shooter that we're familiar with. Really take the Anthem approach, the Destiny approach, the Division approach, add in those various components of a persistent online uh, multiplayer environment and really kind of become what its successors had evolved into. 
And while this is just a trailer and we don't have a release date and we don't have any other additional information on when this game is actually going to come out, it doesn't appear to be anything different from an evolution of the Borderlands 2 framework, really, uh, where you might have more environments, you appear to have bigger, more expansive environments, just based on the power of the PlayStation 4 Pro and the Xbox One X and the modern PC. But you don't really get the impression from this video, and this could be wrong, this is all speculation at this point, but you don't really get the impression from this video that what you're looking at is a Destiny wannabe, is the next Anthem, or is a Division 2. Uh, it looks a lot more like, hey, uh, we think what you loved about Borderlands was its Borderlandsness, uh, and so here's more of that. Here's a Borderlands, and it's the third one. And I think that's an interesting thing to be in the modern AAA game development environment. What we continue to see, and if you've followed this channel, you've seen the number of episodes we've talked about, notions of games as a service, notions of these giant corporations essentially moving towards a either a realization or a belief uh, that the market is moving towards games that are required to be always online, that are required to be live and updated live, that are required to be uh, something other than just a single player experience. And Borderlands and Borderlands 2 had always been a game that had a lot of replayability insofar as you could play it in New Game Plus, you could get additional weapons, you could play with your friends. It has all those components, but it doesn't have this kind of living, persistent, live game feel to it. Uh, and that, in and of itself, is very interesting. I, myself, personally, uh, rather like that. Uh, one of the things that has been bothering me about the industry of late is this seeming uh, coming together into what amounts to one giant type of similar game. Uh, Ubisoft is accused of this a lot. Uh, that you can take Assassin's Creed, you can look at it, you could take Division 2, you could look at it, you could take Far Cry, you could look at it. And fundamentally, at, at the baseline bones of the game experience, it's the same game. It's clearing a map of objectives, it's going through and getting kind of ever-increasing power-ups and ever-increasing weapons, uh, and essentially clearing the map in a more efficient way by filling out skill trees or putting on perks or things like that. And at its baseline level, it's a legitimate criticism. But I don't think that all games should be that. Uh, you've heard me talk on this channel about the, the PlayStation 2 era or the Super Nintendo era uh, and how much more breadth there was in just the games that were available for release, that you could play uh, Shadow of Destiny and then you could play Carnage Hearts and then you could play... Uh, Final Fantasy VI or Illusions of Gaia uh, and put it next to uh, UN Squadron. And you had all these different types of games that were succeeding at a full price level uh, and that weren't all becoming the same game. And I think modern gaming has this issue. And Borderlands 3 is not, is not so separate from modern game development that it's worthy of uh, being put on a pedestal and said, hey, no, they're, they're standing athwart the movement of the industry and yelling stop or what have you. Uh, but it is different enough from what we see happening that I think it's worthy of mention. That right now in this trailer, and hey, the next trailer could prove all of this wrong, so we'll see where this winds up going. But right now in this trailer, it looks to be saying no. This game design, which is different from what all the other AAA game developers are doing right now, can survive on its own. That these different groups of people can actually be serviced by different members of the industry. That we can service these niches without making every game a giant four-quadrant appealing game that everybody's going to love and that everybody needs to update all the time and that it needs to put your hooks in uh, your customer base for years and years on end. If that's the case, I think this is a good thing. And that's very interesting about this announcement to me. The other thing that's really interesting to this announcement to me, uh, and we're going to take a look at uh, how this was described uh, by uh, GamesRadar, 
uh, to talk about what happened yesterday in the PAX announcement. This article is labeled the seven most awkward moments from Gearbox's Borderlands 3 stream. And this was a very long stream. I had it on in the background a little bit while I was uh, negotiating some documents. Uh, And it went on and on and on and on. Uh, And because of the leaks, because of the hints that Gearbox had given to the fact that Borderlands 3 was very likely to be revealed soon, uh, it was everyone's anticipation that this would be the Borderlands 3 announcement. And indeed, in fact, at the end of the day, it was. Uh, But at the end of the day, it was a very long time. Uh, So let's take a look at how this is described in the Games Radar um, uh, article here. And I will put a link into the stream that's available on uh, IGN uh, that actually has the whole thing. If anything pops up that you hear in this article that you want to check out. Uh, But uh, it's a very, very long, long uh, video. And it wound up being... Uh, like I said, a train wreck. Uh, So let's see how they describe it. They say, we have seen the Borderlands 3 trailer and it is good. That's the video we were just watching. The hour-long stage show that Gearbox propped up around it was not. If you watch the event live, you know exactly what I'm talking about. Technical difficulties, stretching for time on top of stretching for time, legitimate audience boos, and the longest magic trick in the history of video game presentations. It's a great sentence. All of that happened. There there was a sequence in which Randy Pitchford... uh, did a magic trick for uh, 10 minutes, 15 minutes. Uh, it's It was a crazy, crazy announcement. If you haven't seen the show yet, do yourself a favor and just read through our Borderlands 3 coverage, or if you insist, warm up your cringing muscles and scroll on. Uh, so they've got these kind of broad categories. 15 minutes of publishing announcement. Gearbox publishes video games, publishes independent video games, and they wanted to tell people what those games were while they had the eyes of the world on them. Uh, this might offend the games radars of the world as a marketing guy as a guy that runs his own company uh this makes a lot of sense you've got the eyes in the world you've got borderlands 3 you know one of the things that people always say uh, or that you can read about in tour books if you go to amusement parks is uh, one of the things that you do is you put the big ride you put the thing that's really exciting to people you put it in the back and you make people walk by all of the smaller rides or the gift shops or the hot dog stand. You put it in the back because that's where people want to get to. And you put everything else that you want to sell them or that you want them to experience in front. So this isn't unusual, although, you know, you could do it better than what uh, Gearbox put out there yesterday. Uh, but it is at least interesting that they went through the process of saying, hey, this is a Borderlands announcement. You guys should be excited about it being a Borderlands announcement. And then we're going to make you wait. Uh, it reminded me a lot of the uh, Battlefield 5 announcement video from last year and from Electronic Arts. If you didn't follow the Battlefield 5 announcement, they did their own kind of video series. It wasn't like this. It wasn't presented in front of a live audience. Uh, or if it was, it was a small studio. Uh, it was controlled by them, and it was people sitting at a desk, and they said that the Battlefield 5 trailer was going to come up, and then they wound up talking about the design of the game and the concept art for the game and things related to the game before showing the game at all, and then they put up a timer, a clock, like you might see on ESPN or uh, PTI or something like that that said, hey, the trailer's going to be in 26 minutes or something along those lines, Uh, and it was a ridiculous way to handle it, Um, and so it reminded me of that. Uh, but maybe with a little bit more humanity uh, insofar as all of this presentation wound up feeling very amateurish, wound up feeling very much like your average student group at your college doing skits uh, and trying to entertain an audience of people getting somewhat more unruly as the hour goes on. Uh, The next thing is Randy Pitchford trying to explain a tabletop game card by card. So they announced a uh, a, uh, a Borderlands uh, card game. And so they just wound up reading some of the rules live on stage. Then Randy Pitchford doing one magic trick for 13 minutes. Uh, and he did. He actually did a magic trick that has three separate components uh, and uh, involves counting out cards one by one twice. And, uh, you know, it was, uh, it was a fine kind of birthday party type card trick. Uh, and it was, just, uh, it was just fascinating to watch. Uh, I do recommend it if on that IGN stream, I believe it's about in the middle of the stream, you check it out. Uh, it's um, It has nothing to do with Borderlands, really. Uh, it's just them stalling for time. They want the trailer to go at the end of this slot that they've, that they've purchased or that they otherwise have access to. And so the rest of the show is essentially them getting to the point where at the 55-minute mark or what have you, they can show the trailer. And you see the next one is described as Randy Pitchford stretching for time, which is exactly what he did. The bigger problem was that the Borderlands 3 trailer being choppy the first time and then also the second. 
So they finally get these trailers uh, up there. Then they had a number of trailers about the Borderlands series. They announced a 4K update. They announced a Game of the Year edition. And they announced Borderlands 3. And all of these trailers are super, super choppy as they're being presented on stream. And, and from somebody that's not at PAX, you can't really tell uh, whether it's uh, just your feed or not. But it became clear that that was how they were actually presenting it in the room at you know something like half frame rate. Uh, and you could still enjoy it. You could still see what they were doing. But it wasn't a very good presentation of the materials. And so when it finally ends, Randy Pitchford tries to put it up a second time. He says, hey, we understand we got it fixed. They put it up a second time. It's just as bad. Uh, and the Borderlands fans are still excited about it. And that's that's good. It's it, This isn't really going to matter in the long run. Uh, but it was one of those moments where you sit back and you think about how the industry has progressed from the E3s of old and from giving stockholder tips and investor presentations to the people sitting in the room that are bored out of their minds. And the game company is finally realizing that that wasn't a success and moving on to a kind of high show, almost Broadway-esque numbers and, and people falling in from the ceilings and cars driving out and things like that. And getting past that now, what we're seeing in the modern era of information presentation is not doing press conferences at all. And one of the reasons you see folks not doing press conferences at all is this kind of awkwardness on stage, the chance for things to go terribly, terribly wrong. And one of the worst things you can do when presenting or announcing your new game is to have that that demo not work, to have, to have that trailer not work properly. And in this case, they have wound up having to rerun a couple trailers a couple times because they weren't working. And then the actual premiere jewel in the crown of what this presentation was supposed to be, its frame rate didn't work until the third time through. And so you see... PlayStation say, we're not going to do E3 anymore. We're instead going to do this state of play thing. And you see that state of play as a series of videos that they can control, that they have the messaging right, that when it's finished, they have this 20 minute video that they know exactly what it looks like before they present it to the world. And that can be very useful to the publishers because they can control their message exactly. It's also very useful to the publishers because it's cheaper. They didn't have to go anywhere to make that video. They didn't have to do anything other than pay the editors and the narrator, really, to put that video together. But one of the reasons I said it's a train wreck that really worked for me is that I miss this kind of humanity. I miss people on stage presenting their passion and what they are trying to achieve with this game that they are making. I miss kind of dopey developer playthroughs live on stage at E3. Uh, I miss folks getting up there and talking about why they do what they do and why they love this series and why it's going to be the greatest thing that you've ever seen. I don't miss magic tricks in the middle of the presentation so much, but that was at least different. And I think as we move more and more away from press conferences and more towards the Nintendo Direct, the PlayStation State of Play, I strongly suspect eventually the Microsoft whatever, Xbox Minute, uh, that you are going to lose some of that humanity. You're going to lose some of those touch points with the people that actually make these things. It's going to become more separated from the audience. It's going to become more separated from the player experience because a direct is great and it's quick and it gets you the information you need, uh, but there's no relationship there. Uh, Nintendo tries to fight that, and I think they do succeed to some extent by having a lot of the executives directly participate in some of the directs to actually put people in front of what they want to say about the games. I think they were even more successful when directs first started with some of the kind of skits and claymation and puppet shows and things that they wound up doing there, and I think it's a reason, one of the reasons why people have such good feelings towards the Nintendo of America president, Reggie fils uh, who was always willing to jump into these ridiculous skits. I think that's one of the things Sony might wind up changing to add that humanity back in. Because as you've heard me say, no one really wants to buy things or support or in general uh, help profit a soulless corporation. We can talk on this channel ad nauseum about the fact that corporations are built to make investors money, and that's all well and good. But... It is helpful for these companies when developing their public relations and when developing their customer base for people to be rooting for them, to root for them to succeed. And you want to root for people to succeed when they're actually people. 
and not a voice on a video and not necessarily something that is so structured, so polished, so public relations oriented that you know that all of the edges have been sanded off and that you're essentially just watching a piece of marketing. All of this is marketing. I think we understand that at a fundamental level. But when you can see people get up there and kind of scramble for time, when you can see them deal with frame rate issues, when you can see them deal with uh, the normal things that everybody else deals with on a regular basis, it helps humanize them. And I think that's a good thing. Now, it also offers you the ability to, for it to be a bad thing. You see here at the end, Randy pitched for blaming the PAX equipment. He got booed on this because, rightfully so, uh, he, he was being a bit of a jerk about the fact that the PAX folks that provided the computers to run the trailers uh, hadn't tested it right or, they, or, or, or Gearbox hadn't tested it right. And so he put a little bit of blame on them for the fact that they were having so many issues with the presentation. Uh, and that's not a great look. And that's the risk you run when you don't 100% control your message because you are presenting live on stage. Uh, but I think it is worth the price to be able to present as humans because, frankly, I think he could have gotten a lot angrier and it would have been a, a very difficult experience for anyone to be dealing with this my company depends on this game being well-received, on it releasing well, and it's having all sorts of trouble in its opening announcement. We all know that's not going to matter. You see the last headline of this article is, none of this is going to matter when we finally get to play Borderlands 3. That's the right takeaway from all of this, from the presentation itself and from everything else. The game always wins out. If it's bad, it'll, it'll be treated badly. And if it's good, it'll be treated well. But... I think presentation matters. I would very strongly like to see the industry not converge on one game design philosophy. I would like the industry to very much not converge on only one way to present its games, to present its messaging. And I think an industry is strong, it is healthy, it, it thrives and it survives if it does have that uh, diversity of thought that it has the diversity of approaches uh, in both designing games and selling them. I think that's where we all kind of enjoy feeling the, the multitude of options and the different passions and the different people out there making these things. And so regardless of what you think of Gearbox, and they've done some stuff that is not great, uh, regardless of what you think of Gearbox, regardless of what you think of Borderlands, I think it is absolutely a good thing to see a company going out there doing something different presenting a game that appears to be moving in a different direction than a lot of the rest of the industry and and doing it at least reasonably well. They dealt with a lot of problems yesterday. They undoubtedly have a lot of articles like that Games Radar article written about them, but they put themselves out there and I think the industry is better for it. Uh, that's virtual legality today. If you like this video, please do like, please subscribe. I am talking about these things seemingly every day, constantly at the very least. I talk about the business and law of software, information technology, video games, anything else that really uh, crosses my eye and I think I could have something interesting to say about it. I talked a little bit about uh, the college indictments and sports scandals and other things that kind of uh, tangentially relate to my day job, my life as a, as a contract attorney uh, and lawyer that helps companies get formed and funded and exited and merged and acquired and everything else in between. Uh, but if you like this video, share it around to where you're located. I can't get to everywhere. Uh, Reddit, Tumblr, NeoGAF, Reset Era, wherever you think somebody might be interested in these kinds of thoughts. I very much appreciate it. I love that engagement. I, at the end of my videos, and if you uh, agree with what I said, please do let me know. If you disagree, I love that even more. I'm a lawyer by trade. If you want to argue with me, I'm happy to do it. I will not take offense to anything you want to say. Please do bring those comments because I'm always happy to see those comments and those criticisms. Thank you again for watching. Thank you for listening if you're listening to it on a podcast. And I will catch you on the very next episode of Virtual Legality.